What's going on YouTube? Today we're going to talk about common information security principles. And this video is part of a room in TryHackMe. The room name is Security Principles. Um, I just wanted to simplify the items or the concepts discussed in that room and lay them down in a way that's easy to comprehend and understand by beginners. So this video is for you if you are new to the security field. These principles <coughs> are heavily discussed or mentioned uh, in all cybersecurity or information security courses such as CISSB, CISM. We're going to talk about these as we progress in the video. Okay, so let's first talk about the first concept in uh, the information security. It is the CIA. CIA stands for, first we have the confidentiality. So confidentiality is the first item in here that's the C the I stands for the integrity and the last one is the A which stands for availability so what are these you will see these um, principles in all cyber or information security courses for example if you are preparing for cism certified information security manager if you are preparing for cissp certified information system security professional also system sec system security certified professional sscp and also you will see these discussed in security plus so, CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability. So let's explain every single one of these. Now the first one, confidentiality, it's actually here to make sure that the data is safe, secure, and only uh, people who are authorized to have access to this data can access the data. Integrity is here actually to ensure that the data is not altered. For example, a file, how to ensure the integrity of a file? How? You know how? It is the hash. So to ensure the integrity of the file, what do we do usually? We take the hash of the file, okay, and we keep it in a safe place. And if we transfer the file to another workstation or through the internet, we again hash the file and compare the hashes. This way we make sure the file is not altered. And this is called integrity. Confidentiality can be exemplified using, uh, or a simple example of confidentiality is encryption. So encryption aims to protect confidentiality. Confidentiality means that the data only is only accessed by people who are intended to access the data. Now the last one is availability. Availability is the readiness of the system to serve the users. A web server should be always ready to render the page or the web page, right? So availability, or let me let me call let me give the example of availability by saying DOS. Denial of service attack. Denial of service attack is an attack that affects the availability of the workstation of the server by rendering the server unresponsive. So when a DOS attack happens and succeeds, we say that the availability is actually compromised. When a file is modified, we say the integrity is uh, compromised. When there is an encrypted file and somehow someone managed to decrypt the file, we say the confidentiality is compromised. These are the CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, Let's talk about the DAD or DAD. So DAD, it's not like what you think. It's not DAD like does, as in father, no. So DAD, we have first disclosure. And the next one is alteration. The last one is destruction or denial destruction or denial so what are these 
DAD is the opposite of CIA. Now, every single item on the DAD list is the opposite of every single item on the CIA. For example, disclosure is the opposite of confidentiality. So when an item, a sensitive file, is disclosed, we say that the confidentiality is compromised. So the opposite of confidentiality is disclosure and vice versa. Alteration. Alteration is the opposite as well of integrity. A file has been modified without or by an unauthorized person. So we say an alteration has taken place, has taken place. So that way alteration is against integrity. And lastly, destruction or denial. We laid down the example before denial of service attack. That's actually denial in the DAD. Destruction is if, uh, say, for example, a server has been infected with ransomware and it's now not available to respond. Or the web server shuts down. We say there was destruction. Okay. Again, if there are sensitive files that have been deleted, then what do we do? We say that confidentiality is compromised because the sensitive files have been disclosed and there is destruction or compromised to the availability. So in a simple word, the, when the confidentiality is compromised, we say we have disclosure. When integrity is compromised, we say that we have alteration. When availability is compromised, we say that we have denial or destruction. In simple words. Okay, now let's talk about defense in depth. Okay, so now we know the three most important security principles when, when it comes to protecting your data. This applies to everything in the information security field. Just everything. Everything you do within a cyber security context or even within information security context to protect your data is actually framed under these three security concepts. To protect the sensitivity of the data, we actually achieve confidentiality. To protect the non or unauthorized modification of data, we achieve integrity. To make sure the servers or the services are always available for the customers or for the users, we achieve availability. That's we, what we always aim in any information security program or under any information security policy, whether it is technical or administrative or even physical. Okay, let's now talk about defense in depth. Now, one way to achieve confidential or one way to be or to achieve the CIA is to implement defense in depth. Defense in depth, when I have multiple layers of security, layer one, layer two, layer three, and layer four. So here we have L1, here we have L2, here we have L3, and lastly we have L4. What do you mean by that? An example of this is this. So we have a network, okay? And to protect the network, we ha should have multiple layers of security. For example, we're talking about the technical layer, right? So the first layer of protecting the network, maybe we can sort these um, according to the exposure to the internet. If, if the, if the, uh, normally the first layer of protection is the layer that's exposed to the internet. So first we got here, say, the firewall, right? The firewall, or normally sometimes it's integrated inside an IPS. Sometimes, not all the time. Now, layer two could be layer two in here. So, the traffic uh, has arrived to the network from some source. So now it's being screened through the firewall or the IPS. And next thing, or the next layer here that we can implement. Let me use another color. The same yellow, yellow one. Okay. Okay, so firewall and IPS, and then after the firewall or IPS, we c the data can go to the right destination, but f first it encounters some sort of segmentation in the network, or we can call it network segmentation or uh, virtualization, so we're going to call it segmentation. So we segment the network to protect, uh, let me correct this one, so we're going to call this segmentation. So why segmentation? What's going to happen here is that, say that the um, the packets arriving to the network carry some kind of malware. 
So if the malware has made it through the firewall or the IPS without the IPS recognizing the signature or the source uh, of the malware, then we got the segmentation. What's going on is the segmentation will not prevent the malware from uh, going through. It's just if the malware, if the malware breaks, breakout happens, it's going to stay only within the boundaries of the host. So take it like that. So here we have endpoint one, endpoint two, endpoint three. Okay, every single one of these is isolated in a single subnet. So if a malware breakout happens here, it's not going to propagate to the network. That's an example of segmentation. Layer three could be, um, yeah, could be some kind of AV antivirus and installed on the host. So if the malware made it through all of these, it's gonna get scanned by the antivirus. Now say that the malware made it through all of these layers. Layer four could be um, encryption. Okay, so encryption here. If you got data sensitive data on the server, and if it is encrypted, the malware, by, uh, the malware author by no chance can unencrypt or unlock the data. So data will stay protected. Now this is a very simple example of defense in depth. Uh, defense in depth expands more than technical security. Defense in defense in depth we can apply yeah technical security, but also we can we need to apply physical security measures. For example, locks on the doors, biometrics. CCTVs, so on and so forth. So when we apply more than one security uh, measure, okay, if we do that, we are actually implementing defense in depth. That's the meaning of defense in depth. All right. Now let's talk about the prominent standard in information security arena. It is the ISO. And let's talk about the design principles. Now many companies, especially information security companies, who are vendors or provide information security services to their clients, they seek actually to get certified and be compliant with ISO because it, is, because it shows that the company is certified and uh, can at the same time audit other companies for the implementation of ISO. Now let's talk about the design principles that ISO lays down which actually every company needs to adhere to if they want to get certified. That's the least. Of course, ISO is like, there's an ISO manually component on the internet to be compliant. It's a very long process. It requires editing, auditing. It requires a full team of information security um, experts to implement the ISO program. But these are the basic principles or design principles that need to be in place as a basic foundation to be certified with ISO. The first thing is least privilege. Least privilege is the principle they sometimes call it the need to know. An example would be an employee who actually was in the HR department. This employee is only given access to the files on the uh, file server of the company that are related to their job function. Okay, they cannot be given access to finance files just for convenience, right? That doesn't need to happen. That's what it means least privilege. People are given access according to their need. They need to know or they need to do. More than that is not given. Attack surface. So attack surface minimization. So here we talk about the systems in place. Web servers, file servers, active directory, endpoints. So what do we do here? We try to minimize attack service by disabling Okay, by disabling unused services. So, for example, if I have a machine acting as a web server, okay, so this machine has port 80 open to the public, right? Web server. Now, if the machine also has a port 20 open for the port 22, sorry, for SSH, and say that the machine doesn't host an SSH server, it's best to disable the port. It's also best to disable any service, port or program that is not used by the machine itself or by the customers or users who access the machine, especially that if the port or program is exposed to the public. That's what we mean by attack surface minimization. The goal is to lower the chances of an attacker finding an open port, finding an open service, an exposed service, or finding um, a program that's exposed to the internet and at the same time has a vulnerability that 
could be exploited. That's what it does mean, attack surface minimization. Or sometimes it's called attack surface. Minimizing the attack surface. Centralized parameter validation. Now this happens a lot in web application exploitation. For example, you see that a page that ends with um, say p p okay dot php id id is say equal one now this is the parameter that's a simple example the simplest example of parameter validation if this parameter doesn't check for the input given from the user the user would be able to um, exploit a multitude and a plethora of application attacks that can start from directory traversal local file inclusion, remote file inclusion, SQL injection, and the list goes on. So centralized parameter validation, we validate the input given uh, from the users. That's the simplest example. Centralized general security services. Now here what do we mean by that? Centralized general security services. If we have <coughs> a machine that's acting, that's authenticating users, could be radio server radius if you have a radio server that's authenticating uh, users okay to access specific resources machines if you have a firewall okay that is authenticating vpn connections to your network it's always good to centralize all of these services in one place one machine or on firewall and the last one is preparing for error and exception handling now this is useful if we are talking about if the application crashes or if the application doesn't understand the input given by the user it doesn't reveal sensitive information and a close example would be if you are testing for sql injection in a web application now best practices say that in order to prevent <coughs> sql injection you have to use parameterized queries now, since the application is vulnerable, but we cannot yet patch it, the least thing that we can do here is to prevent the errors from appearing to the user who is testing for SQL injection. Normally, one uh, surefire sign that the application is vulnerable to SQL injection is that you give it unexpected input and you receive SQL error. The SQL error reveals information about it, about the uh, SQL server used, the version, and the error itself reveals that the software is vulnerable to SQL injection. So we need to have error handling and exception handling in place to prevent disclosure of sensitive information when the application crashes or uh, renders an error. Okay, <coughs> now the the most common the most common question when someone starts in cyber security or information security, what is the difference between threat vulnerability and risk okay now first thing we're going to explain is the vulnerability so first the vulnerability so if you google what does vulnerability mean you'll find out google will tell you it is a weakness a weakness in the system and that's right it's a weakness in the system but but technically how you will link that definition to an actual real example okay for example <coughs> most often if you browse if your vulnerabilities come in the form of or they are coded using this formula c v e uh, the here for example 29913 and then the year 2022 when you see this it means that there is a vulnerability to some to a certain product now the vulnerability it's actually a weakness in the product some vulnerabilities are or have been discovered and they are stored in the national vulnerability database and some of them are yet to be discovered we call them the zero day vulnerabilities zero day vulnerabilities these vulnerabilities have not yet discovered or they have been discovered but there is no workaround or patch to fix them we call them zero, zero day vulnerabilities. So, whether it is zero day vulnerability or it is a past vulnerability, it's actually a weakness in the code of the application. So, 
the person who uncovers the vulnerability found a way to break the code. That's why we call it vulnerable. Now it's vulnerable. Okay. And to prove that it is vulnerable, the exploit developer would provide something called the POC or proof of concept to prove that the code uh, that they discover is actually vulnerable and has some logical errors. So the vulnerability is a weakness in the code or an Ill illogical errors in the code that an exploit developer or a vulnerability researcher would discover. Now, what, what happens when a vulnerability appears? When a vulnerability appears, what's going to happen here? It's going to manifest a threat. So first we discover a vulnerability, then we raise that we actually a threat comes into the uh, playground. So the threat actually it is the danger associated with the vulnerability. It's actually the danger. So now we got a product, a application, a program that's vulnerable. Now there is a threat. There is a danger. Okay that is associated with this vulnerability when exploited. So the danger from what? From exploitation. Okay. So when we got a zero-day vulnerability, okay, it means that there is a danger or it means that there is a threat, okay, that is normally manifested as an exploit. Normally, actually, it means a threat. It means that this vulnerability has a chance of being exploited. So that's the danger or the threat. And lastly, we have the risk. What's the risk here? The risk normally is, uh, if you work as in the risk assessment, you would have this matrix. So the matrix here, you have the vulnerability, right? You have the likelihood, and you have the impact. People who work in risk analysis, I think, understand this. Now here, the vulnerability that has has been discovered, or sometimes it's a weakness. Risk analysis doesn't only deal with vulnerabilities; it also deals with security misconfigurations, as well or mispractices. All of these are risks. Okay, so we have the vulnerability here. The likelihood. So the likelihood means in the percentage out of 100, a scale of 100, how likely is this vulnerability to be exploited? It depends on the age of the vulnerability actually. And for example, all vulnerabilities, they have already exploits. So for an old vulnerability, like six years old, five years old, one year old, sometimes five months old, sometimes one month old. The likelihood of exploiting this vulnerability actually is not less than 70% if it's old. And the impact could vary depending on the product being exploited. In the case of Observer, it will cause machine compromise. Or say, um, shell, remote shell, remote code execution, RCE. So what's the threat now? What's the risk now here? The, the risk here is the likelihood okay, of the vulnerability being exploited in a percentage, 50%, 50% depends on many actually factors. Not only the vulnerability age is, is counted, you have the <coughs> product itself, how complicated the exploit code is, the skills of the attackers. That's why we insert threat intelligence into the equation when we are dealing with risk analysis always. We study the attacker's profiles. We find out, we try to find out if the product itself has been exploited in the past. What, what uh, were the attacker profiles? What tools they used? All of these are actually uh, all together in the equation. So guys, that was the most common, not everything, the most common information security principles. Here we have this. I hope you guys like this and I will see you in the next video.